Yeah, she's a professional. <laughs> yeah. Done it before. Thank you, Tara. Where's Johanna? Johanna? Where's my daughter? She was the big bullhorn in the back. Johanna, come up here. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Christy Forrester, and I know that Johanna really wants to hear her and be here for this. Yeah, Christy Forrester um, is not a new name in our community. Um, she is from Seattle, Washington. Competition, there's always competition. Uh, she's an activist and a survivor. She's a recent graduate of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington. And I have personally admired her commitment to overcoming obstacles in an out and proud way. Um, for a long time, yeah, I borrowed the phrase from the Pride community because it was a good phrase. So we're gonna have Christy do her part and John and I are gonna be right here for you. so many familiar faces and all of you beautiful people. Um, got nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> activist Maggie Kun said, speak the truth even if your voice shakes. <laughs> I might cry. <laughs> Am I? Um, I'm really excited to be here, but I'm also really nervous, so forgive me if I'm imperfect or all over the place or forget to mention something. <laughs> um, I'm here and I'm angry and I'm scared but I'm also full of joy and I'm full of love for life. For my life and for your lives and I don't think that anyone should tell you how to live your life. God, I'm terrified. <laughs> The fact that I am terrified, though, is it speaks volumes to the reason why I need to be speaking. I need to be talking about this. I'm here because I was raped in 2006. I woke up with a strange man on top of me. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know where I was. I was drugged. And I went through the justice system. I decided to prosecute my rapist. Woo! And uh, <laughs> one of the things you learn when you start to go through the path of attempting to prosecute in the justice system <laughs> is that uh, rape is a crime against the state, not against you. And uh, when you want to prosecute, the people who make the decision about whether or not you prosecute are the, are the, are the legal system, the prosecutors. And um, I think that, that takes too much power away from us. And it's a problem because so many people in the justice system believe rape myths and they carry that victim blaming with them. And that blocks anybody's opportunity to move forward to seek justice in the system. I was told that they weren't going to prosecute even though my rapist pretty much confessed. <laughs> and they threw away some of my evidence and I kept fighting and I kept pushing and I didn't have anyone there to advocate for me. But I pushed and I pushed up and I asked for the next prosecutor above that prosecutor and I finally got them to agree to prosecute. that they don't want to prosecute our rapes is because people who sit in the jury believe rape myths. People who sit on those juries, victim, blame. We have to stop victim blaming. We have to give people the right to be heard. After my rape, I was on disability, I had PTSD, I couldn't work, I lost my job. Um, 
In that time that I was on disability, I decided to go back to school and pursue a degree in women's studies at the University of Washington. Because I wanted to find out, how can we better respond to this crime? How can we help people understand what's really going on when someone is raped? And I used to try to organize uh, rallies and maybe two people would show up or 25 people would show up. And I just graduated from the UW last weekend. And I cannot tell you how beautiful you all are. Standing here, supporting this cause, it's like the biggest gift that I could ever, ever ask for. After my rape, my rapist actually pled guilty to a lesser charge, which is something that happens far too often in rape cases. And I think it's ridiculous um, to allow someone to plead down to felonious restraint, which is like basically kidnapping. They basically said, because he was holding you down on the couch like that, because your face was in the cushions, you could have suffocated and died. And that's what they prosecuted. They didn't prosecute rape. the trial was over, they uh, told me that I could have my clothes back. They took my clothes uh, the night of the rape in the hospital, and these are them. Um, I've had them in the evidence bags for almost five years now, and today is the first day that I've opened them. And to you and I speak because I want people to have a voice I'm terrified to speak but I'm gonna keep doing it right. Audrey Lord says the fact that we are here and that I speak these words is an attempt to break the silence and bridge some of those differences between us for it is not our differences which immobilize us, but our silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. <laughs> Victim blaming is such a major issue, and we need to see it stop. And slut shaming is the other portion of this. That's something that I've been trying to grapple with myself. I keep thinking about the word slut and wondering, who does this word benefit? What does this word mean? Who positions themselves as an authority to judge whether or not I am a slut? And if the problem is looking like a slut and what someone thinks is slutty and that causes rape, then what's the option? What's the, what's the solution to that? Make ourselves invisible? No. We are here and we exist and no piece of clothing we put on, whether it's a bikini or whether we're covered head to toe, is a green light for rape. Yeah. assumption that sex is wrong and sexuality has been situated as bad but I think it's a source for love joy spirituality and I'm not gonna let anyone tell me any different especially when that message is backed by threats of rape when I celebrate my joy in that rape is a way of taking someone's power 
and removing a person's choice. Likewise, controlling people's behavior through the use of slut shaming and assuming a position of moral superiority from which they decide what you wear and who you have sex with is also a way of taking your power, being in control, and removing your choice. Up here. Um, thank you. <laughs> Rape is not sex. We've talked about that. And for me, sex is erotic. Audre Lorde says the erotic functions in several ways, and the first is in providing the power which comes from sharing deeply any pursuit with another person. Another way the erotic functions is in the open and fearless underlying of my capacity for joy. It is the creative energy empowered, the knowledge and use of which we are now reclaiming in our language, our history, our dancing, our loving, our work, and our lives. Every oppression must corrupt or distort these sources of power within our culture. And these, the source of power can provide change. Sexual power can bring change. But we are taught from a very young age to villainize this power. We are taught to distrust it, and we are warned against it. But there is a power in choice, a power in love, and the power of the erotic has been very much misnamed by words like slut. I think that's why we need to take this word back and reappropriate it. The problem is that someone else thinks they can tell me how to be, that they know better than I do what's right for me. Even more problematic is the conflation of glowing, joyful sexuality with rape. And the ever-hanging threat that if you enjoy your life and live and love fully and freely with your choice and consent, that someone is going to rape you for doing so. This is about oppression. I think this is why this word is hitting such a nerve, because we are getting down to the root of it. And it can't benefit them anymore when we take all the power away. This is about power, the power to tell women how to act. It is not for anyone else to judge or decide what I wear, what I deserve, where I go, how I walk, who I love, and how I love them. The second word in the slut walk is walk, and we need to focus on that too. We need to focus on the idea that we are here, we're a community, and we are together. This is solidarity and this is power. And because you are here, and we are here together, we are not alone in our silence, and we are not alone in our pain. We celebrate our courage together, our strength, the power of love, the joy of being in our bodies, of being proud and beautiful. Our bodies hold our hearts and our souls, and they should be loved and respected in whatever form they take, and however they are dressed. This is about joy. I've talked about pain and anger, but my greatest resistance is joy. Joy in expressing myself. And I want a world where we can be free to express all the joy and beauty we feel in our hearts without it inciting violence. Talking about this stuff is hard sometimes. <laughs> Very hard. The conversations we have here today, that we start here today, they might be messy. And they're going to continue to be messy. These conversations are difficult, but we can't shy away from having them. These conversations have been hiding in silence for a long time. And we may talk about it in flawed ways, but we need to keep talking. One more quote from Audre Lorde, who I love. <laughs> um, 
I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood, that speaking profits me beyond any other effect. My silence had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. So, in closing around silence, let's get loud. <laughs>